10 Strangest Missing Persons Cases There are many adjectives that can be used to describe missing persons cases, sad, mysterious, tragic, baffling. However, you could also add the word controversial to that list. When a person disappears, that can sometimes only be the tip of the iceberg in a complicated and bizarre story. 1. Brooke Henson Henson resided with her family in Traveler's Rest. South Carolina in 1999. She hosted a party with several friends during the evening of July 3, 1999. Henson's parents returned from a concert in Charlotte, North Carolina at approximately 2 a.m. on July 4. She was sitting on their front porch at the time of their arrival. Henson said that she and her boyfriend had a disagreement earlier that night. She told her family members that she planned to walk to Willis's store on the corner of Hawkins Road and points at highway to purchase cigarettes. Henson departed from the house at approximately 2.30 a.m. after another verbal dispute with her boyfriend, and was last seen walking along Henderson Drive. The store is approximately two blocks from her residence. She left a note for her boyfriend, saying, follow me if you care. Henson never returned home and has not been heard from again. Henson's boyfriend, Sean Shirley had a volatile relationship with her and he and his friends refused to cooperate with the investigation into her disappearance. He has a criminal record for drug-related offenses and assaults, but he hasn't been named as a suspect in Henson's disappearance. Many of the people in Henson's life were involved in criminal activity. In New York City, a woman registered registered for graduate classes at Columbia University's School of General Studies using Henson's name date of birth and social security number. She took criminology and psychology courses for two years before anyone noticed. The ruse was discovered in June 2006, when the woman applied for a job under Henson's name, and her prospective employer did an internet search and found out Henson was missing. Investigators subsequently identified the student as Esther Elizabeth Reed. A photograph of Reed is posted below this case summary. When authorities confronted Reed, she claimed she was actually Henson and had left her home voluntarily. Investigators doubted her story and arranged for her to take a DNA test, but she never showed up to have the test done. Instead, she fled, taking nothing except her cat and her toothbrush, hairbrushes and combs. Reed has a history of stealing other people's information and using their identities to enroll in colleges and universities including Harvard University and California State University. Although she did coursework at reputable colleges under her stolen identities, Reed herself never completed high school. She passed her GAT exam under Henson's name before enrolling at Columbia. She also claimed she was a European chess champion. Reed took out over $100,000 in student loans ran up credit card debt and obtained a passport under her stolen identities. Reed was on the run for two and a half years before she was arrested in Chicago, Illinois in February 2008, and charged with mail and wire fraud, possession of false identity documentation, and identity theft. In August, she pleaded guilty to federal fraud and identity theft charges. In February 2009, she was sentenced to four years in prison. Reed stated she never meant to harm anybody and only took Henson's identity to rise above a painful past. Authorities believe she was an opportunist who didn't actually have anything to do with Henson's disappearance. Henson's loved ones stated that it is extremely uncharacteristic of her to leave without warning. Her family said that authorities did not begin a search of the area, until three weeks after her disappearance. Investigators reportedly believed that Henson left of her own accord, and expected her to return shortly afterwards but now they suspect foul play. Her family describes her as a fun-loving woman who enjoys hiking and being outdoors. She dropped out of high school in the 10th grade. Investigators believe Henson was murdered and they have a suspect in her disappearance, but there is not enough evidence to charge him. Her case remains unsolved. Evidence 2. Walter Collins On March 10, 1928, nine-year-old Walter Collins disappeared from his home in Los Angeles. California. His believed abduction triggered a massive manhunt, yet police were unable to find the boy. That is, until a mysterious child appeared five months later in DeKalb, Illinois, claiming to be Walter. Elated, Walter's mother, Christine Collins, arranged for her long-lost son's return trip home. The case seemed to have a happy ending. Except for one thing, when Walter arrived, it wasn't Walter at all. Christine knew immediately that she was staring into the eyes of an imposter. Nevertheless, Authorities told her to take the boy home and try him out for a couple of weeks. Christine reluctantly agreed, only to return to the station soon thereafter, 
refusing to accept the boy as her own. She even brought dental records with her to prove the validity of her claim. Bizarrely, the police ignored the mother's plea. Instead, they believed Christine had suffered a nervous breakdown, and committed her to a psychiatric hospital. After locking Christine away, authorities interviewed little Walter. The boy soon confessed to his stunt. He told officers his name was Arthur Hutchins, Jr. and that he had run away from his home in Iowa. A drifter picked him up and remarked on his resemblance to the missing child from California. So Arthur decided to impersonate Walter and make his way to Hollywood. Upon his confession, authorities released Christine from the mental hospital. She would eventually file a lawsuit against the Los Angeles Police Department, and be awarded a hefty sum though the amount was never paid. But the mother had far greater concerns on her mind. What happened to Walter? Where was her boy? Tragically, the answer came in the form of a brutal young man named Gordon Northgate. Gordon Northgate, a Saskatchewan native, had relocated to Wineville, California in 1926, just outside Los Angeles. There, he built a chicken ranch with the help of his young nephew, Sanford Clark. Gordon was far from a caring provider for Sanford. The deranged chicken farmer repeatedly abused his nephew behind the closed doors of his ranch for nearly two years. It wasn't until 1928, when Sanford's older sister Jessie Clark came to visit Wineville that the darkness unraveled. Jessie arrived already concerned for the welfare of Sanford, who soon told her of the horrors Uncle Gordon had committed. Upon Jessie's return to Canada, she reported the story to a representative at the American consulate who dispatched the Los Angeles police to the chicken ranch in Wineville. There, authorities found Sanford, but no Gordon. The man had spotted the squad cars coming up the drive and fled. With the help of his mother, he made it all the way to Vernon, British Columbia, until the two were finally apprehended. Now safely in the hands of the law, Sanford felt he could finally recount the atrocities he had suffered and seen. Not only had Gordon molested and beaten him, but the brutal man forced Sanford to help kill three young boys whom Gordon had kidnapped. One of those boys was little Walter Collins. The bodies of the dead had been set alight in the desert, so nothing more than hair and bone fragments were recovered. Nevertheless, it was enough to convict Gordon Northgate of murder. The man was sentenced to death, while his mother received life imprisonment for aiding and abetting her ruthless son. It's believed that there may have been additional victims amongst the feathers of the Wineville chicken coop as well as countless boys who were molested but escaped Gordon's thirst for blood. As for Christine Collins, sadly, because the body of Walter Collins was never recovered in full, the grieving mother refused to believe her child had died. She continued to search for the boy for the rest of her life. The heartbreaking tale of one mother's search for her missing child was turned into the 2008 film Changeling, starring Angelina Jolie. 3. Relia Wilson. Relia and her two siblings were removed from their mother's custody when Relia was an infant. They were placed with Gerilyn, alternatively spelled Gerilyn, Graham, their alleged grandmother or godmother, in Miami, Florida in 2000. Their mother, Gloria Wilson, abused cocaine and neglected her children. Her parental rights were eventually terminated. Photos of Gloria and Graham are posted below this case summary. Florida's Department of Children and Families, DCF was obligated to check on the children's well-being during monthly visits. The final recorded visit for the family took place in early January of 2001, when their social worker, Deborah, sometimes spelled Deborah, Muskley, stopped by Graham's residence. A photo of Muskley is posted below this case summary. Graham told authorities that an unidentified African-American female arrived at her home in the 10,100 block of Southwest 145th Place on January 18, 2001. The individual claimed to work for the DCF and said that she was removing Rilia from the home for an evaluation. Rilia had reportedly been diagnosed with behavioral problems prior to the visit. She has never been heard from again. Graham said that the alleged abductor spoke with a thick accent that may have been African in origin. The woman, Graham said, was extremely familiar with Rilia's history and said Muskley was aware of her visit. Graham stated two other people visited her home in February 2001 and requested additional toys to help Rilia become accustomed to her new surroundings. Muskily and her supervisor, Willie Harris, resigned from the DCF in March 2002, omit accusations that their records of home visits were fraudulent. The agency contacted Graham during its investigation into Muskily's records. Authorities learned about Rilia's possible abduction in April 2002. 
15 months after the child disappeared. Graham said that Muskelly was not one of the individuals who visited her home one month after Rilia disappeared. Muskelly's attorney said that his client offered to cooperate with authorities regarding Rilia's case. He also claimed that Muskelly was being used as a scapegoat by the DCF to mask its own internal problems. Muskelly was criminally charged with 41 counts, including grand theft relating to her alleged deficiency at her job. She pleaded guilty to one count of official misconduct and had the grand theft charge adjudicated, and was sentenced to five years probation. The other 39 charges were dropped. Muskelly admitted that she billed the state as a social worker for times, when she was actually at her other job as a teacher. The state sought $5,000 in restitution for Muskelly's salary sick pay and vacation pay. She has not been charged directly in connection with Rilia's disappearance. Graham told several media outlets that she contacted Muskelly several times after Rilia was removed from her home. She claimed that Muskelly told her that the child would be returned shortly. Graham admitted that she continued to cash checks from the state of Florida for Rilia's care after the child had disappeared. Graham said that she called the DCF to report the error but maintains that she was instructed to keep the money due to the difficulty in the reapplication process. DCF officials said that they have no record of Graham's phone calls, and only learned of Lilia's disappearance on April 25, 2002, which is the date she was reported missing. Graham said that she believes Muskley was aware of the circumstances surrounding Lilia's disappearance, but nothing has been proven. The DCF has been under scrutiny for some time as bureaucratic mistakes in other situations were discovered. The agency has since acknowledged that it failed Drillia. Investigators believe Drillia was a victim of foul play quickly began treating her case as a possible homicide. Authorities noticed that Drillia's physical characteristics were similar to those of Precious Doe, an unidentified African-American child who was brutally murdered and discovered in the Kansas City area in April 2001. DNA tests ruled out any match between Rilia and the unidentified child in May 2002. In 2005, Precious Doe was identified as Erica Michelle Maria Green, a three-year-old who had never been reported missing. Gloria told reporters Graham was not Rilia's paternal grandmother. Graham denied that statement, but admitted her son, Kenneth Epson never took a paternity test to confirm if he fathered the child. Graham maintains that Gloria has claimed several men fathered Rilia, but none of the allegations have been proven. Gloria said that she met one of Graham's daughters in a substance abuse rehabilitation center prior to Rilia's birth. She said that she elected to name Graham as Rilia's godmother. The actual relationship between Graham and Rilia is unclear. Manville Cash claimed to be Rilia's father in early May 2002. He is currently imprisoned after being convicted of automobile theft and drug charges. Cash was named as Rilia's prospective father on papers terminating Gloria's parental rights. He has never taken a paternity test to prove his claims. Cash told the media that he saw Rilia three times a week prior to his incarceration. He said that he saw the child for the final time at her third birthday party at the home of Pamela Kendrick in Brownsville, Florida. Pamela Kendrick is often referred to as Pamela Graham and some accounts claim the two women are sisters, but they are not, in fact, related. Kendrick is Cash's aunt and Gloria allowed her to take custody of Rilia shortly after her birth. Rilia was removed from Kendrick's house in April 2000. After allegations of neglect surfaced, Kendrick denies any wrongdoing in Rilia's case. Rilia and the other children were placed in Graham's custody shortly thereafter. A photo of Kendrick is posted below this case summary. Authorities removed Rilia's siblings from Graham's care in early May 2002. Graham hired an attorney and claims that there was no reason for the custodial change. Investigators have reportedly administered polygraph exams to several of Rilia's relatives but the results have not been publicly released. Media reports revealed that Graham has used 42 different aliases over the past 20 years. She was convicted of food stamp fraud in Tennessee during the 1980s, and was sentenced to probation in Florida as the result of theft charges. Reports stated that Graham filed at least eight lawsuits for personal injury compensation child support and racial discrimination charges throughout the years. Graham has been sued by 12 creditors and was named in seven landlord-tenant disputes. A physician diagnosed Graham with a psychotic syndrome similar to schizophrenia months before Rilia, and her siblings were placed in her custody. Her attorney claimed that the stories deflected attention away from the DCF's errors. He also said that Graham used numerous aliases in an attempt to hide from an abusive former boyfriend during the 1980s. Graham continues to maintain that she suffered severe injuries, 
and memory loss in a vehicular accident in the mid-1990s. Gloria has admitted that she was not able to care for her children while she struggled with her cocaine addiction. The DCF was aware of possible problems at her home since 1996, when a neighbor became concerned that Gloria's children were being neglected. She relocated to Cleveland shortly after Rilia's birth. She said that she told the DCF about her plans. Graham told the media that Gloria's anger over Rilia's disappearance was contrived and said that she had not spoken to her daughter since 1999. Gloria claims that the agency instructed her not to contact her children after leaving Florida. Gloria has never publicly identified Rilia's father and at least one additional man has claimed Rilia is his child. Authorities said that testing to determine her paternity is not being being conducted at the present time, a Miami pastor and his wife came forward in mid-May 2002, and announced that they have had custody of Rilia's older sister for several years. The couple told the media that Gloria joined their church in 1995 and promised to improve her life with their assistance. Rilia's half-sister was an infant at the time and the couple said that Gloria neglected her. They provided material goods for the child until Gloria asked them to care for the baby during the weekend. She never retrieved her and the child has resided with the couple since that time. Court records indicate that Gloria was given numerous chances to rehabilitate herself during the following years but she has not seen her daughter since 1996. The couple decided to finalize the adoption process in the late 1990s, but their DCF caseworker was Muscoli. They claimed that Muscoli neglected to check on the child's welfare and was difficult to keep in touch with. The pastor said that Harris, Muscoli's former supervisor, visited their family after Rilia's case came to attention in April 2002. He said that Harris claimed the DCF had too many cases to track and defended himself and Muscoli. The couple received word that the DCF was preparing adoption papers for them in April 2002. They had been asking for the documents for years beforehand. In mid-May 2002, a judge ruled that Rilia's younger sister, Rodrika Wilson, was neglected by DCF officials and by Graham and Kendrick. The judge stated that Rodrika suffered from developmental problems, and an untreated eye condition. Neither the DCF nor her caregivers provided needed medical care when necessary. Media sources speculated that authorities may begin searching locations in the Miami area for possible evidence in the near future. The reports have not been confirmed. Investigators said that they have not received any tips regarding Rilia's whereabouts. America's Most Wanted profiled Rilia's case in May 2002. But the producers omitted a sketch of the unidentified female Graham claims abducted the child in 2001. The series' representatives stated that the most accurate sketches were created before witnesses viewed lineups or photos of possible suspects. Graham looked at numerous photos at the DCF's headquarters after Rilia's disappearance was reported. The sketch was considered compromised as a result. Media reports stated that officials located a witness who may have seen Rilia and Graham together in February 2001. One month after Graham claimed a DCF worker removed the child from her home, a medical worker reportedly told investigators that Rilly really accompanied Graham and Rodrika during the latter's checkup. Graham denied that Rodrika's physician saw Rilia. In addition, sources allege that Graham may have falsified Rilia's vaccination records in 2001 to continue receiving state benefits for the child's care. Documents reportedly state that Rilia was vaccinated after she disappeared. Sources claim the doctor who signed the papers never saw Rilia on the specified date. Authorities continued to focus on Graham and Kendrick's actions in their investigation. In October 2002, the two women were charged with stealing over $14,000 from the state of Florida. Officials stated that Graham and Kendrick engaged in fraud by accepting funds from the state for Aurelia's care after she disappeared. They were later convicted. Graham was given a prison term and Kendrick was placed on probation. Authorities stated that both women have consistently failed lie detector tests in connection with Rilia's case. Graham allegedly told at least six people that an unnamed Spanish woman had taken Rilia on a trip to New York or New Jersey after the individuals noticed the child's absence but before the DCF did. She said the Spanish woman intended to adopt Rilia. When confronted by police about her changing story, Graham said the woman returned Rilia before the DCF worker picked her up and she vanished. She denies abusing or killing the child and has stated she believes Rilia is still alive. Graham says Kendrick is making up the abuse allegations to escape a long prison sentence. In August 2004, two and a half years after Rilia vanished, Graham was charged with kidnapping and three counts of child abuse, and Kendrick with two lesser counts of child abuse, 
neglect. Kendrick pleaded guilty to neglecting and abusing Rilia, but not to harming her, and was sentenced 364 days in prison, followed by five years probation. She promised to testify against Graham at her trial. She says both of them spanked Rilia with switches, locked her a dog cage and in the laundry room and occasionally handcuffed her to her bed at night. Kendrick denies any knowledge of what happened to Rilia, however, and claims she asked Graham that question several times and got no answer. In March 2005, Graham was additionally charged with first-degree murder in connection with Rilia's case. Investigators believe the child was suffocated or beaten to death sometime in December 2000, a month before Graham says Rilia disappeared and over a year before the DCF found out about it. Graham could face the death penalty if convicted. A large part of the evidence supporting the charges came from information provided by Robin Lunceford, a former cellmate of Graham's, who says Graham confessed Rilia's murder to her. Lunceford said Graham told her Rilia had demons from her previous abuse experiences. Rilia had refused to wear an angel costume for Halloween and wanted to dress up as Cleopatra instead which caused Graham to decide she was evil and had to die. Graham supposedly buried her body in a ravine near a private lake where she had previously gone for fishing and cookouts. A photograph of Lunceford is posted below this case summary. She is a career criminal with 15 convictions for robbery and a history of prison escapes, and she was awaiting trial for another armed robbery charge when Graham supposedly confessed to her. Graham's defense questioned her credibility emphasizing her criminal history. In June 2005, Lunceford ceased cooperating with authorities and stated that she would not testify against Graham unless she could get a much reduced sentence for the robbery in return for her testimony. The prosecution offered 20 years. Lunceford wanted three. Earlier, she had stated she had gone to the police with her information out of conscience and was not expecting leniency in exchange for her cooperation. At Graham's bail hearing in August 2005, Lunceford invoked her Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination and refused to testify against her. Lunceford was convicted of the armed robbery in September 2005 and sentenced to the maximum, life in prison without the possibility of parole, under Florida's habitual violent offender laws. Prosecutors later came to an agreement with her, however, and in March 2011, her sentence was reduced to 10 years in return for the promise to testify against Graham. She is scheduled for release in March 2014. Kendrick cooperated with the prosecutors and told them she had nothing to do with Rilia's disappearance but knew all along that Graham was making up the story about the DCF worker coming to take Rilia. Graham's trial took place during December 2012 and January 2013. Lunsford Kendrick and Muskley were among the witnesses who testified. Graham's attorney argued there was no evidence Rilia was dead, and suggested she had been sold. The jury convicted Graham of kidnapping and child abuse, but deadlocked 11 to 1 on the charge of murder. The judge declared a mistrial on the murder charges, and Graham was sentenced to 55 years in prison for the crimes she was convicted of. As she is presently in her late 60s, the sentence will probably keep her in prison for the rest of her life. Nevertheless, the prosecution has elected to retry on the murder charge. Rilia has never been located, but foul play is suspected in her case due to the circumstances involved. Suspected in her case due to 4. Michael Rosenblum In 1980, 25-year-old Pittsburgh native Michael Rosenblum was struggling with a years-long addiction to prescription painkillers. On the morning of February 14, Michael woke up with a severe drug hangover, so his girlfriend, Lisa Scherer, took him to a hospital, but Michael refused treatment. The couple stopped at a nearby gas station, and got into an argument until Michael drove off in Lisa's car and stranded her there. This would be the last time he was seen alive. Shortly thereafter, Lisa's car was discovered abandoned on River Road by the Baldwin Borough Police Department, but Michael was nowhere to be found. It would not be until 1992 when a skull fragment belonging to Michael was found in a nearby wooded area known as 40 Acres. The cause of Michael's death is still unknown. Over the years, Michael's father, Morris Rosenblum, would fence himself engaged in a battle with the Baldwin Police Department, as there were a lot of sketchy events to suggest they may have been involved in Michael's death. Even though Lisa's abandoned car was found by the Baldwin PD on February 14, she was not informed about it until May 21. The Pittsburgh PD had issued an alert about the vehicle after Michael was reported missing, but the Baldwin PD did nothing with this information and the car just sat on a towing yard for three months. In response, 
the Baldwin PD produced a copy of a letter which was allegedly mailed to Lisa and signed by Chester Lombardi, the officer who found the car. The letter was dated February 15, but Lisa claimed she never received it before and after the car was discovered. Morris Rose and Bloom received two separate anonymous phone calls from someone claiming that Michael had been arrested by the Baldwin PD. After the debacle with the car, Baldwin Police Chief Aldo Gabari authorized a search of the River Road area, but it only lasted three hours. Curiously, Gabari denied permission for the searchers to check certain sections, including the 40 acres wooded area where Michael's skull fragment was eventually found on July 15. An arrest warrant was issued for Michael after he supposedly committed an armed robbery at a pharmacy in April. While the witnesses claim that the robber wore a large aviator sunglasses, the Baldwin PD made the odd decision to produce a composite sketch of the suspect not wearing sunglasses. In fact, the composite sketch looked like a deliberate carbon copy of Michael's photo from his missing persons poster. The arrest warrant was issued by a police officer named Warren Cooley, and even though he did not follow proper procedure, Chief Gabari still signed off on the warrant. At the request of the Pittsburgh PD, the warrant was cancelled and the real perpetrator of the robbery was eventually caught in 1986. Morris Rosenblum received an anonymous letter claiming that Chief Gabari orchestrated a cover-up and that he contacted a former Baldwin police dispatcher named Margaret Jean Haslett. Haslett would tell Morris that in May 1980, Gabari asked his clerk, Fred Gopelli, to type up a letter to Lisa Scherer about her vehicle being found and backdated to February 15. Fred Capelli corroborated Haslett's story and also claimed that Chief Gabari asked Chester Lombardi, the officer who found Lisa's vehicle, to sign the letter, but Lombardi refused to do so since it was backdated. Gabari then ordered Capelli to forge Lombardi's signature on the letter. Chester Lombardi died in 1982, but Robert Weber, the other officer who found the vehicle, claimed that Chief Gabari had approached him about signing the backdated letter, which he also refused to do. After Morris Rose and Bloom wrote an angry letter to the Baldwin Borough Council, they held a hearing and voted to fire Chief Gabari. However, the decision was later overturned by the Baldwin Civil Service Commission and Gabari was reinstated, as he was allegedly good friends with people on the commission in January 1989. This case was profiled on Unsolved Mysteries but Gabari and the Baldwin PD refused to participate in the segment. The writer of the anonymous letter was identified as a Baldwin police officer named George Galovich and a producer from Unsolved Mysteries tried to contact him. Galovich's roommate, another Baldwin police officer, decided to impersonate Galovich and contact the producer, advising the show not to film the segment. Galovich was suspended from the police force within hours of the call and later fired in May 1988. Pittsburgh Magazine ran an extensive article about the case and made some disturbing allegations about two Baldwin police officers, Donald Misinsic and Warren Cooley, the same officer who issued the questionable arrest warrant for Michael. Shortly before Lisa's vehicle was found, Cooley and Misinsic were on their way to serve a warrant at McKeesport, a route which would have required them to travel along River Road. According to police logs, the two officers never showed up to serve their warrant and were not heard again on the radio for nearly three hours. Cooley and Misensic felt this article unjustly accused them of causing Michael's death and sued for defamation of character. The lawsuit was eventually settled out of court. 5. Helen Bratch Helen kept a checkup appointment at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota on February 17, 1977. The doctors there found nothing wrong with her save that she was overweight. After paying her bill, Helen began walking back to her hotel. She stopped at a gift shop and purchased $41 worth of cosmetics and bath towels, telling the clerk she was in a hurry because her houseman was waiting. Investigators are not sure what Helen meant. She was traveling alone and no one was seen with her. Helen did have a houseman named Jack Matlick. A photograph of Matlick is posted below this case summary. He helped run Helen's house after her husband, Frank, died. Frank had been the owner of E.J. Bratch and Sons and was one of the world's wealthiest candy producers. He met Helen, a native of Ohio, when she was working as a co-check girl at the Palm Beach Country Club in Florida. After their marriage they lived in Chicago. Illinois during the summer and rented a house in Palm Beach, Florida in the winter. Frank and Helen apparently had a very happy relationship. He died in 1970, 
seven years before Helen's disappearance. He left her with an estimated net worth of $20 million. Metlock claims he met Helen at O'Hare International Airport when she flew from Rochester back to Chicago, but the plane crew could not remember anyone matching her description on the flight that day. They were not interviewed until a significant period of time had passed. However, Metlock says he picked up Helen at O'Hare and drove her back to her home in Glenview, Illinois. That weekend, Matlock called his wife and said he would be staying in Glenview because he had work to do. This is uncharacteristic of him, he normally lived apart from Helen in a house she owned in Schomburg, Illinois. Matlock told police later that Helen had stayed in Glenview that weekend preparing for her upcoming trip to Florida. But friends who dropped by to visit her were told she was unavailable, and Helen did not call anyone which is uncharacteristic of her. Matlock said he drove Helen to O'Hare at 7 a.m. on Monday without much luggage or flight reservation. Helen normally traveled with lots of luggage and a carefully planned itinerary. She is also a late riser who would not normally fly out so early in the morning. There is no record of Helen flying out of O'Hare that day. Matlock said Helen signed several checks totaling $15,000 before she left. Many of the checks were to his benefit. When investigators determined the checks had not, in fact, been signed by Helen, Matlock changed his story and said he had signed the checks for her because she had injured her hand. Handwriting analysis experts do not believe he actually signed the checks, however, and the signatures were never tested against anyone else's writing. Matlock's wife said he gave her a different story about Helen's disappearance, he said she did not return from the Mayo Clinic and he was waiting for her in Glenview. That weekend in Glenview, Matlock arranged to have carpeting replaced in one of the rooms of Helen's house, and had two rooms repainted also. The workers who did the job did not notice anything out of the ordinary about the room. Matlock had the pink Cadillac he'd been driving cleaned and waxed, and the interior shampooed. Matlock did not try to report Helen missing for over two weeks after her disappearance. The missing person's report had to come from a family member, so he contacted her brother, Charles Verhees in Ohio and notified him about his sister's disappearance. After flying to Illinois and reporting Helen missing, Verhees and Matlock searched her Glenview home for clues. Matlock destroyed her diaries, which she had written in every day for years. Verhees says Helen left explicit instructions that they should be burned if anything happened to her, so he allowed Matlock to burn the papers outside of his presence. Authorities' initial suspect in Helen's disappearance was Matlock. No ransom demand had been made for Helen and investigators did not think Matlick's story was credible. He took a series of lie detector tests but the results were inconclusive. John Edwalader Mink, an attorney, was appointed to look after Bradge's estate in her absence. He was not permitted to see her will, but Matlick told him she had willed all her money to various charities and to Verhees. Mink tried to question Richard Bailey, whom Bratch had been dating at the time of her disappearance and was supposed to meet her when she flew to Florida, but Bailey hired an attorney and refused to cooperate with Mink. He would not even admit he knew Bratch. A photograph of Bailey is posted below this case summary. He was active in the city's horse market. He was the owner of Bailey Stables and Country Club Stables. Bailey had a reputation as a con artist around Chicago. He would romance recently divorced or widowed middle-aged wealthy women then fleeced them out of their money through bad investments in horses. Bailey had introduced Helen to the horse business, her accountant estimated that she had spent $250,000 on horses. Bailey and his brother had sold Helen some horses for much more than they were worth. Helen was declared legally dead in 1984, and her brother and some animal protection organizations got most of her money. Helen's case remained open but inactive until 1989 when a prosecutor investigating horse fraud took a closer look at her disappearance. It was revealed that Bailey had connections to Silas Jane, the founder of the Jane Gang, which was involved in the horse business and in organized crime. Silas is a possible suspect in the 1966 disappearances of Renee Brell, Patricia Blau and Dan Miller, who vanished together from Indiana Dunes State Park in Indiana. They rode their horses at one of Silas's stables. Silas had an established reputation as a vicious, cold-blooded gangster and many feared him. Police believe he and Richard Bailey were involved in Helen's apparent abduction. They theorized that Helen realized Bailey had scammed her, and was planning to tell authorities and have him jailed, and he conspired with others and had her killed to silence her. In 1994, Bailey was charged with numerous counts of fraud and with conspiring to commit murder, soliciting to commit murder, and causing the murder of Helen. Bailey pleaded guilty to racketeering, conspiracy, 
mail and wire fraud and money laundering and admitted to conning elderly widows and divorcees. He denied scamming Helen, however, or having anything to do with his disappearance. Before a federal judge, after hearing the evidence against him in Helen's case, a federal judge decided Bailey had conspired to kill her and sentenced him to life in prison. The sentence was later reduced to 30 years. Bailey is not believed to have acted alone in Helen's case, but no one else was ever charged in connection with her disappearance. If it were not for the Bradge allegations, he would have been sentenced to only about 11 years in prison. In 2005, investigators announced that an individual, later identified as Joe Plemons, had come forward with information about Helen's alleged murder. Plemons, a horseman who had known Helen, confessed that he and ten others, including a police officer, beat and shot her to death at the behest of Silas Jane and his nephew, Frank Jane Jr., and incinerated her body at a steel mill off of Interstate 65 near Gary, Indiana. Plemons admitted to being the shooter after signing an agreement granting him immunity from prosecution. He said Helen was murdered to keep her from going to the police about being swindled in bad horse deals. He also stated that Bailey had nothing to do with the murder. He named nine of the conspirators, the tenth, a woman, he did not identify because he says he never knew her name. Plemons stated that the female conspirator impersonated Helen and used her plane ticket home from the Mayo Clinic and that Helen herself was actually driven home. Police are searching for corroboration to support Plemons's confession, as of yet there is not enough evidence available to charge his alleged accomplices with anything relating to Helen's case. Silas Jane died in 1987, and Frank is serving a prison sentence in Illinois for arson. He denies involvement in Helen's disappearance, as do all the other alleged conspirators who are still living. Plemons has given multiple contradictory accounts of his involvement in Helen's death and is an admitted lifelong con man, but his testimony had previously helped put a man in prison for murder. He testified against Kenneth Hansen at Hansen's 1994 trial, for the 1955 murders of three young boys. Hansen is one of those implicated by Plemons in Helen's murder. He died in prison in 2007. Plemons told investigators that he finally confessed to his involvement in Helen's death, because he could not bear the guilt anymore. One piece of evidence which may support Plemons's testimony is a ruby ring, which he says fell off of Bratch's finger, while he was disposing of her body. He kept the ring and later turned it over to the authorities. Bratch's friends and family identified it as hers but authorities haven't been able to prove this through DNA testing. A photo of the ring is posted below this case summary. Bailey sought a new sentencing hearing as a result of Plemons's testimony, arguing that the evidence proved he was innocent of involvement in Helen's disappearance, and should therefore be released from prison. The court ruled against him in 2005, however, stating that the evidence would be more appropriate to overturn his conviction than reduce his sentence and in any case it did not prove he was not complicit in Helen's murder. Although Bailey might be able to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, it is likely that he will remain in prison to serve his full sentence. Matlock died in a Pennsylvania nursing home in February 2011, at the age of 79. Plemons lives in Florida. Helen's remains have never been found, but foul play is suspected in her disappearance due to the circumstances involved. 6. Robin Abrams. Abrams and her father waved to each other as they passed each other on Ganino Road during the early evening of October 4, 1990, in her hometown of Beecher, Illinois. That's the last time he or anyone else saw her, she has never been heard from again. Abrams's vehicle, a red 1989 Dodge Daytona hatchback, turned up 11 hours later in Harvey, Illinois with the doors locked and keys still in the ignition. Her camera was in the car but authorities located no trace of Abrams at the scene. A witness said two men in a tow truck dropped the car off at 10 p.m. At 3 a.m., a neighbor called the police to report someone breaking into the car. Investigators then linked the car to Abrams. Three days after Abrams vanished, her purse was found in a residential area three blocks away from the car's original location. Whoever took it left her wallet, but took the credit cards from inside it. Abrams dated a married police officer, Anthony Marquez, beginning in 1987. Her family wasn't aware of his marital status. They met while she was working at a McDonald's restaurant and he convinced her to join the sheriff's department. They hired her as a deputy in January 1988. In October of that year, Marquez allegedly smashed a car while Abrams was behind the wheel and her mother was in the passenger seat. She ended her relationship with him and in November she filed a complaint against him, 
saying he'd harassed her and slashed her vehicle's tires on four occasions. Marquez was charged with criminal damage to property, but the charge was dismissed for lack of evidence in April 1989. The Sheriff's Department terminated Abrams in December 1988, two weeks before the scheduled end of her probationary period. A short time later, Marquez filed a criminal complaint against her, alleging harassment. The complaint was dismissed. But Marquez filed additional harassment complaints against Abrams in the summer of 1989. She was arrested several times that year, including in May for disorderly conduct and in August for reckless driving. Marquez claimed she'd tried to run him off the road. No charges were brought in the disorderly conduct case and, in October 1989, a jury found Abrams not guilty of reckless driving. In November 1989, Abrams got an order of protection against Marquez. She accused him of stalking her and falsely claiming she'd smashed her vehicle into his. The order was extended until November 27, 1990. In December 1989, Abrams filed a federal lawsuit against Marquez and seven other members of the Sheriff's Department, alleging wrongful termination, sexual harassment and violation of her civil rights. She was scheduled to give a deposition in the case on October 22, 1990 but vanished 18 days before that. It's unclear whether Abrams's problems with the Sheriff's Department contributed to her disappearance. The Will County Sheriff's Department initially investigated her case, but the state police took over the investigation shortly after it began, citing a possible conflict of interest. The police department fired Marquez in December 1990. He still lives in the area. Abrams's lawsuit was dismissed in January 1991 because the plaintiff could not be located. One theory is that Abrams disappeared deliberately to spite Marquez, but most investigators think she met with foul play and is now deceased. Her family believes Marquez was involved in her disappearance and stated Abrams told them if she ever went missing. He probably had something to do with it. She graduated from Sandberg High School, Moraine Valley Community College and Governor's State University, and planned to eventually go to law school. Her case remains unsolved. 7. Sna Ann Philip Philip is in her third year of residency in internal medicine at St. Vincent's Hospital, now called the Richmond University Medical Center, on Staten Island. New York in September 2001. She did not have to work on September 10th and decided to relax and go shopping. She left her apartment in Battery Park in Lower Manhattan at 5.15 p.m. Philip is last seen at 7.18 p.m. on September 10th. She was captured on a security camera at Century 21 department store in New York City, New York. Her toenails were painted purple at the time of her disappearance. Philip was carrying two large shopping bags containing about $550 worth of lingerie, three pairs of shoes, and bed linens when she was seen on the security tape. She has never been heard from again and there was nothing in her apartment to indicate that she ever made it back there. A clerk at Century 21 says she saw Philip shopping with another woman whom Philip said was a friend. Philip's companion is described as 5 apostrophe 2 and 115 to 120 pounds with short black hair, she is possibly of East Indian descent. She has never been identified. Philip's husband, Ronald Lieberman, arrived at their apartment between 11 o'clock and 11.30 p.m. that day and saw that his wife was not there. He was not assumed she was spending the night with her brother or her cousin, something she often did when he worked late. Lieberman did not report her disappearance to authorities until the next day. All of her relatives later stated that they had not seen her. Philip disappeared the day before the September 11th terrorist attacks in New York City, when two planes crashed into the World Trade Center and caused the deaths of over 2,000 people. Philip's brother told the media that she was last seen running into the World Trade Center towers to offer her assistance after the attack. The story sounded plausible because Philip is a doctor and resided near the towers but it was untrue. Her brother admitted he lied about the circumstances surrounding his sister's disappearance to attract attention to her case. All of Philip's credit cards, except her husband's MX card which she used at Century 21, were left behind at her home, as was her passport and other identification. Her family believes any clues there might have been were obliterated in the chaos of September 11th. Lieberman believes she may have spent the night of September 10th elsewhere and was killed in the terrorist attack while walking back to her own apartment, which was only two blocks from the World Trade Center. He theorizes she possibly went into the World Trade Center to offer medical assistance to the wounded. Police disagreed with Lieberman's theory and suggested Philip had left of her own accord to escape a troubled life. There were allegations, which her family denies, 
that she had substance abuse problems and had engaged in lesbian affairs. She was also facing criminal charges. She accused a colleague of grabbing her inappropriately, but authorities did not believe her story and charged her with filing a false complaint after she refused to recant. Philip was in court over the false complaint charge on the morning of the day she disappeared. Lieberman stated their marriage was happy and she had no reason to walk out of her life. Years after Philip disappeared, Lieberman petitioned to have his wife declared a September 11th victim. No trace of her belongings or her remains were found at the site of the World Trace Center but many of the known victims' remains were completely obliterated. A lower court declared Philip legally dead in 2004, but stated there was insufficient evidence that she had died in the September 11 attacks. Lieberman appealed and, in January 2008, the judge who heard his appeal agreed that Philip had probably died in the terrorist attack. The judge admitted there was no proof of this but said he believed it was the most likely explanation for Philip's disappearance. Lieberman cannot collect any compensation from the federal September 11th Victims Fund for his wife, as the fund closed in 2003. He stated he merely wished to get closure in her case and add her name to the victim's memorial. Philip was born in the province of Carolyn on the coast of southern India and moved to America as a young child. She is a graduate of Johns Hopkins University and Chicago Medical School. Her loved ones held a memorial service for her in September 2002, a year after her disappearance. 8. Felipe Santos and Terence Williams Williams was last seen in Naples. Florida on January 12, 2004. A Collier County Sheriff's deputy, Corporal Stephen Henry Calkins, claims he stopped him on the road. Williams was driving a white Cadillac, which was having engine problems. He did not have a valid license or insurance, his registration had expired, and the vehicle belonged to someone else. He could potentially have been cited for six moving violations. Calkins says he did not cite Williams for anything but dropped him off at a Circle K convenience store in the vicinity of Wiggins Pass Road and US 41. Williams told him he worked at the store, although a press release by the Sheriff's Department maintained that no one at the Circle K store ever had contact with Calkins. A Circle K employee stated in a press interview that she saw both Williams and Calkins that morning. She says Calkins used the store's bathroom and Williams filled a container with gasoline and left the store alone. Calkins later stated he left Williams at the store returned to the Cadillac to have it towed, then called the Circle K store and discovered Williams did not really work there. However, his cellular phone records do not show the call being placed, and store employees did not remember it either. Oddly, Calkins was also the last person to see another man, Felipe Santos, who disappeared in October 2003. He got into a minor car accident and Calkins reportedly gave him a ride to a Circle K convenience store. He has never been heard from again. Williams's parents filed an additional complaint against Calkins after their son's disappearance and Calkins was subsequently fired by the police department. An internal investigation had previously exonerated Calkins of wrongdoing in the Santis case but ruled that he had lied about the Williams case and violated agency policy. Authorities stated that Calkins gave inconsistent accounts of the events leading up to Williams's disappearance, and eventually stopped cooperating with the investigation. He took three polygraph tests about the Williams and Santos cases, and one of the tests showed evidence of deception. Calkins, a 17-year veteran of the police department, had a clean record prior to this incident. He appealed the ruling but it was upheld and his dismissal stood. He has not been charged in the disappearances of Williams or Santos and maintains his innocence in both cases, stating he was being treated as a scapegoat by the department and both men had reasons of their own to walk away. Williams's mother believes her son did not leave voluntarily, however, she states that he would never let so much time pass without contacting her. He kept in almost daily touch with her before he vanished. Many of his belongings were left behind at her home. Williams was employed as a cook at a pizza hut in Bonita Springs, Florida at the time of his disappearance. He had only had been working there a few weeks. He also has work experience in the construction field. He has a criminal record for driving under the influence and trespassing and spent time in prison in the 1990s for aggravated robbery. Shortly after he vanished, a Knoxville, Tennessee court issued a warrant for his arrest for failure to pay child support. Williams has four children by four different women. He resided at Randall Circle in Naples at the time of his disappearance. There is no evidence of foul play in Williams's case and investigators believe he may simply be lying low to avoid being arrested.
but the circumstances surrounding his disappearance are unclear. His case remains unsolved. Some agencies report that Williams was last seen in the vicinity of 111th Avenue and Vanderbilt Drive in Naples. 9. Nicholas Barkley Nicholas was last seen playing basketball with friends in his hometown of San Antonio, Texas on June 13, 1994. He called home and wanted his mother to pick him up, but she was asleep and Nicholas's older brother refused to wake her. He never returned home. Authorities initially believed Nicholas left of his own accord. He had done so before, but never for more than a day. His mother stated that he occasionally hit and cursed at her and the police were often called to the residence in response to arguments. His mother had had her brother move into their home in an effort to keep her son under control. Nicholas was frequently truant and got into trouble when he did attend school. He has a juvenile criminal record. He broke into a convenience store, stole a pair of shoes and threatened a teacher. The sentencing hearing was set for June 14, the day after he vanished. One possibility was placement in a group home, and Nicholas was very opposed to this. On September 25, Nicholas's older half-brother called the police and said he thought he saw Nicholas trying to break into the family's garage. Nicholas fled when he realized his brother had seen him. The police searched the neighborhood, but couldn't find him. They don't believe Nicholas's brother had in fact seen him, and neither does their mother. Law enforcement officials received a phone call from a man at a youth shelter in Linares, Spain in October 1997. Over three years after Nicholas's disappearance, the caller said that Nicholas was living at the Spanish shelter after escaping from a child sex ring operation. The man said that the person believed to be Nicholas had been abused for years. Nicholas's sister flew to Spain, identified the person as her brother, and brought him back to Texas. Nicholas's mother believed the man was her child, but many other people, including his uncle, were suspicious of his claims. The individual had dark brown hair and dark brown eyes and spoke with a French accent and European phrasing. He claimed his abductors had chemically altered his hair and eye color and that he picked up different speech patterns from living in Europe for so long. The individual refused to voluntarily give blood samples or have his fingerprints taken to confirm his identity, and he refused to name his abductors. In February 1998, the Federal Bureau of Investigation FBI got a court order to take the individual's fingerprints in blood and determine a match with Nicholas. The fingerprints identified the man as Frederick Pierre Burden, a 23-year-old French citizen who was posing as Nicholas. Burden has a criminal history in Europe and has used many aliases. He pleaded guilty to passport fraud and perjury in 1998, admitting that he had posed as Nicholas after getting the missing boy's information from a missing child center. After Burden was exposed, he made several contradicting statements about Nicholas. He claimed he had known Nicholas in Spain and that the boy was alive, he claimed he had proof that Nicholas was deceased, and later he denied having ever met Nicholas at all and stated he knew nothing about the case. He was sentenced to six years in prison, more than three times what the sentencing guidelines suggested, because of the harm he caused the Barclay family. After Burden's identity was discovered, Police began investigating Nicholas's family for possible involvement in his disappearance. His mother was addicted to heroin in 1994, but she went into recovery after he vanished. She passed one polygraph about Nicholas's case, but failed the second one. Nicholas's brother developed a drug problem after his disappearance and he died of a cocaine overdose later in 1998. He had been considered a possible suspect in his brother's disappearance and with his death the investigation stalled. Nicholas has never been located and his case remains unsolved. He may still be living in the San Antonio area. While many agencies continued to classify him as a runaway, foul play is possible in his disappearance. 10. Isabella Miller Jenkins Isabella's parents, Janet Jenkins and Lisa Ann Miller, were lesbian partners. They met in 1997, and moved in with each other a few weeks later. In December 2000, the couple were joined in a civil union in Vermont. Their home state of Virginia did not recognize civil unions at the time. Gay marriage was legalized there in 2014. In 2001, they made the decision to become parents, and Lisa conceived Isabella with sperm from an anonymous donor. Janet never legally adopted her. Four months after the child's birth, the family moved to Fairhaven, Vermont. Lisa had fertility treatments to try to have another baby but wasn't able to. The couple were members of a Unitarian Universalist congregation. In 2003, Lisa and Janet ended their relationship amicably. Lisa filed to dissolve the civil union in November of that year, 
and moved back to Virginia with Isabella. The women had an informal agreement where Janet would pay child support and have regular visits with Isabella. Janet and Lisa's cooperation ended after Lisa joined the Thomas Road Baptist Church, a conservative congregation founded by evangelist Jerry Falwell, and renounced her homosexuality. She now believes homosexuality is a sin. When Judge William Cohen in Vermont dissolved the couple's civil union in 2004, he gave custody of Isabella to Lisa and liberal visitation to Janet. Lisa regularly refused to allow Janet access to Isabella, however, because she felt Janet was not the child's mother but rather a friend. She testified that Janet was a physically and emotionally abusive partner, and she also accused Janet of sexually abusing Isabella. She stated Janet's visits with Isabella had caused behavioral problems in the child, including bedwetting, nightmares and threats to commit suicide. Janet denied these allegations under oath, and Virginia's Child Protective Services deemed the abuse accusations unfounded. Judge Cohen fined Lisa $25 for every day she refused to let Janet see Isabella, and he made the ruling retroactive. Lisa quickly accumulated thousands of dollars in fines. Lisa fought the case up to the state Supreme Court of Vermont, which decided against her ruling that Janet was Isabella's legal parent and the case was the same as any custody dispute between heterosexual parents. Lisa then tried to change jurisdiction to Virginia. The lower courts sided with her, but the Virginia Court of Appeals ruled that Vermont had jurisdiction. The United States Supreme Court declined to hear the case. On November 20, 2009, Judge Cohen found Lisa in contempt of court and awarded custody of Isabella to Janet saying this was the only way the child would be able to spend time with both parents. Lisa took Isabella and disappeared sometime in the fall of 2009. It's unclear exactly when, but her neighbors said they hadn't seen her since September. Investigators believe she initially took Isabella to Canada and then to Mexico. She was supposed to turn the child over to Janet on January 1, 2010, but she never did. Judge Cohen gave her 30 days to comply with the ruling then found her in contempt of court and issued a felony warrant for her arrest on charges of kidnapping. In April 2011, Timothy David Tymo Miller, no relation to Lisa, was arrested in Alexandria, Virginia and charged with aiding and abetting Lisa and Isabella's flight. He was a Mennonite missionary in Nicaragua and authorities believe he helped Lisa and Isabella leave the United States and move to a safe house in Nicaragua's capital city of Managua. In October, Authorities dropped the charges against Timothy in exchange for his cooperation in the investigation. In 2014, however, Timothy was indicted again in New York State for helping Lisa and Isabella go through New York to Canada. Although he had provided testimony on videotape, he did not return to the United States to testify, so the prosecution believed he had reneged on his agreement to cooperate with the investigation. Kenneth L. Miller, no relation to Lisa or Timothy was indicted for aiding international parental kidnapping in December 2011. A pastor with the Beachy Amish Mennonite Church in Stewart's Draft, Virginia, he allegedly aided Lisa and Isabella's flight by having fellow Amish Mennonites purchase plane tickets for them to fly from Canada to Nicaragua, via Mexico and El Salvador. The two females were wearing the long dresses Mennonite women wear. Kenneth had purchased them. In Nicaragua, they initially stayed with Amish Mennonite missionaries on a rural farm. Lisa homeschooled Isabella, who used the name Lydia and learned to speak Spanish. Kenneth was convicted of aiding in international parental kidnapping and sentenced to 27 months in prison in March 2013, but didn't actually begin serving his sentence until March 2016. His appeal was rejected. Citing religious reasons, he has refused to testify against other individuals whom authorities believed to have helped hide Isabella and Lisa, he stated he was privileged to stand with Lisa. In October 2014, Philip Zodiates, a businessman from Waynesboro, Virginia, was indicted for conspiracy and international parental kidnapping in connection with Isabella's abduction. Authorities believed he helped Lisa and Isabella by driving them to Buffalo, New York and crossing the Rainbow Bridge with them into Ontario. The Southern Poverty Law Center, which tracks hate groups, identified Zodiates as a Christian right activist who ran a now-defunct magazine called Spotlight, which featured anti-Semitic articles and advertisements for neo-Nazi groups and the Ku Klux Klan. At his trial in September 2016, Zodiates admitted he had driven Lisa and Isabella into Canada, but said he was simply doing it to be kind and wasn't attempting to obstruct Janet's parental rights. He was convicted of international parental kidnapping and conspiracy. In August 2012, 
Janet filed a filed a civil racketeer influence and corrupt organizations, RICO, suit against Lisa, Kenneth, Timothy, the Liberty University School of Law, the Thomas Road Baptist Church and others, alleging they'd all assisted in Isabella's abduction and conspired to keep the child hidden. The suit is pending. The Miller-Jenkins custody battle has made national headlines because of the issues it involves. Isabella and Lisa may still be in Nicaragua or they may be in El Salvador or Costa Rica. There haven't been any sightings of them in several years. Janet has gotten married to another woman, and she still hopes to be reunited with Isabella. Her case remains unsolved. United